All right, chapter 17 is one of my favorite chapters. If you were taking my face-to-face -face class, we spend a lot of time in class talking about this. So we're going to try to sum up what's going on in chapter 17 and give you a good overview of the differences between the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. These two things are building on one another. If you go back to the Middle Ages, the, uh, the Middle Ages view of the universe, the medieval view of the universe, championed by Greek philosophers like Aristotle, or even Ptolemy later on, is that the Earth was the center of the universe. That's a geocentric model. The uh, Everything revolved around the Earth, and uh, that everything, the Earth, the heavens, the stars, revolved around uh, the Earth. It's a pretty kind of self-centered view of uh, ourselves and our place in the universe, but it was the accepted view, and it was championed by the church as well. But starting in the late 1400s into the early 1500s, you start to see scientists, astronomers challenge this view. One of the first was Copernicus. Copernicus was a mathematician as much as he was a, a, an astronomer. And Copernicus was trying to calculate the eclipses. And uh, he could do it, but he had to build in a lot of corrections into his math in order to make the, uh, the, the eclipse times work out. And he thought that that was ridiculous. In a, in a perfect universe, why would he have to build in corrections? He changed the model. He moved uh, the sun to the center, moved the earth to uh, its place, and lo and behold, his math began to work out. So Copernicus is actually one of the first to champion a heliocentric model, a sun-centered model. It gets him in trouble. And many of these guys are not only challenging uh, science, accepted science at that time, but they're also challenging the church. You get to others like Tycho Brahe and his student Kepler, who will use... Brahe was really the... the he was the astronomer and uh, he had from his observatory this huge amount of data that Kepler would then use and apply mathematics to. And uh, what you begin to see is uh, this more rational, more scientific view of uh, the universe. If you sort of look at the, the old view here where the Earth is the center and everything else revolves around it, People began to question this, but they have to do so using science. And one of the things that's going to help a lot of these guys is the invention of the printing press. They can distribute these ideas and people can read them. And now you can go and either try to prove them right, try to prove them wrong. So uh, moving towards Copernicus's idea, Copernicus's ideas are published. And so others can look at them and begin to challenge them or once they sort of do the same math, find out that, hey, maybe this Copernicus guy is right. So new tools start to show up, including a telescope. Galileo will uh, begin to use these tools, and uh, Galileo does the same math and comes up with uh, this idea that, hey, Copernicus is right. He also observes things like Jupiter, and here you can see his observations, and you notice these little stars that he has around Jupiter and what he kind of figures out is that hey these aren't stars these are other things and they're moving uh, around Jupiter that throws this whole idea that everything revolves around the earth and these perfect little spheres into uh, the trash can and uh, Galileo is going to start pioneering a new view that things are in motion that things aren't static that things are moving and these bodies are moving not necessarily around the earth, but around other bodies as well. Well, that flies in the face of the church. He gets put under house arrest, really has to uh, to really work under the, uh, really the, the observation of uh, the church, and it gets him into real trouble. The, uh, he also took a great deal of time studying the moon. It's something that all of us can see with our naked eyes, and it's not perfect. And uh, you can see that Galileo is starting to chip away at some of these accepted ideas. I told you Kepler uses a ton of Brahe's uh, observational data, puts the mathematics to it, and what he comes up with is observations that these bodies, the planets especially, aren't moving in perfect circles. 
And in fact, they're speeding up and slowing down, and he can prove that mathematically. What he doesn't really exactly know is why, but the person that figures all that out is this guy, Newton. Okay, Newton will uh, kind of put all of the pieces together and create what we essentially call the mathematical picture of the universe or the mechanical view of uh, the universe. So Galileo is uh, the one that sort of pioneers some of these ideas. Kepler can prove them somewhat mathematically, but Newton puts it all together into this mechanical view of the universe. If you've done any kind of physics or you've done any science in uh, your academic career, you know and you've heard of Newton's laws of motion that object at rest stays at rest, object in motion stays in motion, force is equal to mass times acceleration. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Newton starts putting these things together, and he starts looking at what others are doing. He starts really doing the math. He even uses a form of the calculus that really no one had used up until that point, and what he comes up with is this, this idea of gravity. Gravity is a force. And it's the force that, according to Newton's view, bound the universe together. Every object in the universe attracts every other object with a force. Gravity is a force. So he writes all this down in uh, the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. Sometimes in the Latin, it's called the Principia. And in 1687, really what Newton comes up with is this mechanical view of the universe. It changes how we do science. Okay, most of you have done the scientific method in your courses, inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning. Descartes, for example, uh, is a mathematician, but he uh, removes all doubt and finally gets down to the only thing that he cannot doubt is himself, that he exists. I think, therefore, I am. And so uh, he believed that really the foundation for uh, this was uh, human reason. The foundation for science was human's ability to reason, and that by combining inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning, we come up with what we really, what Newton really used, which is the scientific method, and of course, it's what we still use today. So there's Bacon, and there's Descartes, if you want to know what they look like. The uh, The thing that this sort of helps us build is a, a new science, okay, that we are able to observe, we're able to experiment. We start seeing the other natural sciences develop like chemistry. They, they're mathematical in nature. In nature, they are, uh, they use reason. This trust in reason is what helps kind of throw scientific revolution into other realms. What you start seeing a lot of these enlightenment thinkers that we're going to talk about is applying science to us, applying science to our own world. You start seeing science, for example, applied to politics and the state. Thomas Hobbes and John Locke give us two competing ideas about government. Both of them, though, are founded on scientific ideas. Hobbes, for example, in his Leviathan, will uh, challenge uh, this notion that we uh, have to have uh, an absolute ruler based on what God wants us to do. Hobbes believes that we are so bad that the only thing that we can have is an absolute monarch to really keep us in check, to keep us in place. We need a government with total power because we are so bad. Locke's a little bit more optimistic, and in his two treatises on government, he talks about how uh, we are a little bit better than that, and that we can govern ourselves, that government is a contract, that we enter into government so that it can uh, do what's best for all of us. If it fails, we change it, just like the English had changed their government during the Glorious Revolution. So if we don't like it, we change it, and we put into place a government that will. You start to see many of these philosophes, as they're called, uh, right, believers in the Enlightenment, believers that reason and science can lead us into uh, a, a new age, building on what Newton and Locke are uh, writing about, including Locke's ideas about us and about how we think. 
that we can build a better world. And you start seeing some of these philosophes attack certain parts of uh, our lives they don't like. Montesquieu, for example, is a French nobleman who will write satire criticizing the French government. And uh, he really believes that in the spirit of the laws that separation of powers is the way to go. We'll use that extensively here in America to uh, build our government later on. The uh, Probably the most famous of uh, the Enlightenment philosophers is Voltaire. Voltaire is considered to be the best example of an Enlightenment thinker. He will uh, write. He will be a champion of... Uh, human rights. He was a scientist in many ways. He was a philosopher. He was a writer. He was an author. He was a humanitarian. He will be a believer in uh, a new form of, uh, of belief called deism. Voltaire is not a big fan of organized religion. Saying that this is an attack on Christianity is a little bit bold. He wasn't a big fan of any organized religion. He also wasn't a fan of atheism either. So uh, Voltaire didn't think that you could prove the existence of God, but you couldn't disprove it either. So uh, Voltaire actually, as a deist, believed that there was a God, that God created the world, but God does not interfere in the affairs of mankind anymore, that we're on our own. So uh, you go through the text and you read about deism, You'll read about Diderot, for example, who will uh, evade censorship, but he will be heavily censored and heavily observed by the French government as he puts together his encyclopedia and uh, is an attempt to present knowledge, new knowledge, to uh, everyone so they can see what's been going on in the Enlightenment. And, of course, his encyclopedia is not going to be very popular with the church. One of the things that benefits the uh, the Enlightenment, just like it benefited the uh, the, the Renaissance is uh, or the uh, the Reformation, is the the printing press moving things out to where people can start seeing them, and uh, being able to read and being able to read some of this on your own is really important. Well, the last I want to talk about is Rousseau. If you'll read in the chapter about the social contract you will see that Rousseau is a fan of what he calls the general will, that we all should give up and give up our individuality. In exchange, we should all work together to make our lives better. And so Rousseau is seen as someone who believes that we are all beholding to the general will. The uh, as you move into the last part of the chapter, you'll see a little bit about society and the Enlightenment, newspapers, uh, libraries. Okay, if you're interested, also this is a big change in art. You start to see coffee houses and salons where people come together and uh, start talking about what's going on here. Okay. It changes politics. We start to publish the proceedings of Parliament. We start publishing the proceedings of uh, government so that people can view them, so that you can read them. Uh, and the last part talks a little bit about how uh, this affects Europeans and how they start to believe that maybe they are the center of the world. And uh, But the Enlightenment does have an impact on slavery. You start seeing the growing opposition to slavery showing up. And, of course, slavery will eventually be abolished by the time you get to the early 1800s, or at least the slave trade will be. For women, Mary Wollstonecraft is one of the most important people. Her vindication of the rights of women, one of the most important treaties is about the rights of women during the Enlightenment. So make sure that as you read this chapter that you understand that the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment are building on one another and that these events and these people have a big uh, role in what's going to come next, which is the age of revolution. All right, 